In the last section, we looked at non-negative series, or we could have looked at non-positive series, but what, what was important was that we looked at series where all the terms had the same sign. So we're all zero or positive, and you could have equally as well handled series where all the terms are zero or negative. Um, the, as, as, as I said when we did those sections, the, um, those types of series, non-negative series, are well-behaved because the partial sums form an increasing sequence, and increasing sequences converge if and only if they're bounded above. That's what's at the heart of why non-negative series are easier to deal with than series with both positive and negative terms. In this section, we do want to look at general series, series with both positive and negative terms. Um, in general, those series are much more difficult to deal with. We don't have as many convergence tests. In fact, we basically have two. Um, one says, and I'll say this rigorously in a minute, but one of them says that if you have a series with positive and negative terms, and you replace it with the series that has the absolute values of those terms in it, so you kind of force all the terms to be non-negative, so you take absolute values of all the terms. If that new series converges, then the original series converged. Um, so that's one way we can tell about convergence of, of series with positive and negative terms. That's a, that's a nice result, and we say the original series converges absolutely if when you put absolute values around the terms, you get a convergent series. Essentially, there's only one other way that one other general way that we tell that series with positive and negative terms converge, and that's the alternating series test. And for that, we need a, an alternating series, a series that goes plus minus, the terms go plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, or minus plus minus, plus minus, plus. Um, aside from that, it's, uh, we won't have any general test for telling us when a series uh, with positive and negative terms converge. Um, they are inherently more difficult to deal with. So let me just state this as a theorem. In the book, this is proved for you, but I won't give the proof, but it's a theorem. If the sum is k goes from m to infinity, so you've got a series of the absolute values of some terms converge. So if this converges, then the original series converge before you put absolute value signs around it. Um, so this is, this is nice for us. Um, for instance, we could take a fairly bizarre series, put in some minus signs, not necessarily alternating, like we could take something like, for example, start with the sum as k goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared. Look at this. So take this and negate every term in which k is po uh, prime. So what would that series look like? Well, I'll just write out some terms, but it starts with 1. 2 is prime, so we negate that term. 3 is prime. We negate that term. 4 is not prime. Um, 5 is prime. 6 is not prime. 7 is prime. Anyway, you get the idea. You negate all the, all the terms where the k is prime. Um, it's, uh, the terms don't alternate. They don't go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So even when we have an alternating series test, that won't help us with this. But the theorem we just stated tells us, oh yeah, this converges. Why? 
Well, because if you take the absolute values of the terms, you get exactly this P series where P is 2. And there's a P series, P is 2, that's greater than 1. This converges. So the theorem tells us this also converges. Um, great. Um, what it converges to is another question entirely, but the theorem tells us it converges. Um, in fact, we call this kind of convergence, so we have a definition. We, we give this kind of converging of, by this test a name, definition. If this converges, then, then we know this converges, but we give that kind of convergence. Then we say, yeah, we know this converges, so we're not making up new terminology for that. But when, in fact, the, absolute, the series you get by taking the absolute value sign, we say that the original one converges absolutely, which is kind of a little, a little pun. You know, it converges when you put in absolute value signs, and, or it really converges. Um, OK. So it, with this terminology, what we just said is that that series that, where we negated the terms with uh, prime squared denominators, that series converges absolutely. Um, the, um, we'll, so we also give a name to series which converge for which the absolute values, the series you get from the absolute, by putting in the absolute values, where that diverges. So if, if, um, if the sum as k goes from 1 to n of a k converges, but but when you put in the absolute values, it diverges. Then we say that this converges conditionally. So for instance, so what does this mean? This means that right, if, if this diverges, we, we had a theorem, the theorem I just stated said, if this converges, the series converges. But the series can converge while the absolute value, the series with the absolute values can diverge. That can happen. And for instance, and we, we know an example of this, and you should know one quickly, the alternating harmonic series is kind of the prime example, the most basic example of this. Right? The alternating harmonic series, we know that series converges. But when you take the absolute values of the terms, then you get the harmonic series, which we know diverges. So yeah, then we say the series converges conditionally. So a fundamental example, the fundamental example, of a series that converges conditionally is this. It does not converge absolutely. Nonetheless, it converges. So at this point, there are three possibilities for us. We, we actually care about distinguishing between these two kinds of convergence, um, converging absolutely and converging conditionally, and then of course the series could just diverge. So really, at this point, we have a series could do three things, converge conditionally, converge absolutely, or diverge. Um, OK. Um, absolute convergence is a. Uh, is nicer than conditional convergence. It's, uh, I've, I said this when we were going through the last section, and, uh, and I'll say it again now. Rearranging the terms in an absolutely convergent series does not affect the sum. Rearranging the terms in a conditionally convergent series 
you can change the series by rearranging the terms, by taking them in a different order. You can make the series diverge to positive infinity, diverge to negative infinity, or add up to anything in between that you want. It's really kind of astounding. Um, so I'm just going to state this as in the book. This is stated as two different results, but let me just go ahead and combine them for the sake of speed theorem. Rearrangements, so I, I defined this in the last section. It's just where you take the terms in a different order. Rearrangements of absolutely convergent series do not affect convergence. Or what? Or, or the value that the series converges to. Or the rearrangements of absolutely converge. Well, I guess I've used for or the values that the series converge to. I'll just write this. Conditionally convergent series. I could say this more precisely, but this is the big deal that if you take the terms of a conditionally convergent series in a different order, you can just completely change what happens. You can make it diverge to infinity, diverge to minus infinity, or add up to anything in between. Just so this isn't completely mysterious. Let me, I don't know how convincing this will be, but just so it doesn't look completely absurd. What happens is if the series converges conditionally, like the alternating harmonic series, what happens is it's not too difficult to show that all of the positive terms have to add up to positive infinity. And all the negative terms have to add up to negative infinity. Those are not particularly difficult to show, those two things. And, but once you believe that, that all the positive terms add up to positive infinity and all the negative terms add up to negative infinity, then it's easy to believe that what you can do is rearrange and take, suppose you want the series you want to rearrange terms so that this convergent series adds up to positive infinity. You just take a bunch of the positive terms first. Like take a whole bunch of the positive terms until you get a really big part. And then take one of the negative terms. And then a whole bunch of positive terms that add up to a lot more. And then subtract one relatively small negative term. I mean, add a negative term, so subtract something. Anyway, by just taking more and more of the positive contribution early, you can make the partial sums get arbitrarily big and positive, and so you can make the series diverge to positive infinity by changing the order in which you do things. This means that conditionally convergent series are somehow not sums in a traditional sense. The order in which you encounter the terms matters. As for absolutely convergent series, that is not the case. You can move the terms around, no matter what order you take them in, they all add, it always adds up to the same thing. So the con absolutely convergent series, it, it is as though there's this infinite collection of numbers, and you're talking about what you get if you add them together. Conditionally convergent series are not like that. It's not like there's this big collection of positive and negative numbers, and you're just adding them. The order in which you add them matters. OK, I think I've beaten that into the ground enough. Um, it's also true that absolutely convergent series um, sums, if you have two absolutely convergent series, their sum is absolutely convergent. If you multiply each term of an absolutely convergent series by the same constant, 
each time, the series is still absolutely convergent. So you can work with absolutely convergent series pretty much how you, <laughs> how you want. Um, the, the real point is absolutely convergent series are nice. And conditionally convergent series are uh, a little worrisome. Um, the ratio and the root test uh, are normally stated with absolute values in them. Um, we had the ratio and the root test in the last section for non-negative series. They, their, their general statement applies to series with positive and negative terms. So I'll state the ratio test first and then just change it to the root test. The ratio test, so I no longer am assuming I have a non-negative series. Suppose you have the sum as k goes from m to infinity, so you have some series, and, and the limit as k approaches infinity of the k plus first term, the absolute value of the k plus first term of dk converges, well, equals L, where, so either this limit, this limit of the sequence converges to some real number L, or once again we allow L to be positive infinity, where L is an extended real number. So that just means we're allowing for the possibility that L is positive infinity. Positive, because the absolute value signs would have to be. Then we get the conclusions that we got before from the ratio test, um, but I need to make some comments. Um, so one, if L is less than one, then the sum is K goes from m to infinity of bk converges absolutely. Well, of course it does. This test is what you would get if you applied the ratio test to the series with the absolute value signs around the terms. So, you know, this is the L that you would calculate if you put the absolute value signs around the terms, and from, our last, from the last section, we know that if that L comes out less than 1, then the series with the absolute value signs around the terms converges. But then that's what it means for this series to converge absolutely. It means it converges in, in the strong sense that if you put absolute value signs around the terms, the sum converges then, too. Um, great. So that's true. This would not normally... Oh well. Let me write it and then let me say this. If L is greater than 1, then the sum as K goes from M to infinity would be K diverges. Now, you have to be a little careful in how you think about this. It, it is not because that means, ah, oh, the series diverges absolutely. We don't talk about diverging absolutely. It's true that that L being greater than 1, you know, just instantly means that if you put absolute value signs around the BKs, that that series diverges. I mean, that's what you can conclude immediately. But that doesn't, that itself, just that the series with absolute value signs around the term diverges, does not imply that the original series diverges. Keep the alternating harmonic series in mind. The alternating harmonic series, if you put absolute value signs around the terms diverges, the alternating series, it, alternating harmonic series itself converges. The fact that this test implies that the series with absolute value signs around the terms, the fact that it implies that that diverges does not imply that this diverges. The reason this is still true, as it was with non-negative series, is because of something I said when we did that, which is when L is greater than 1, in fact, the terms are not approaching zero. When, when L is greater than one, then eventually the terms are getting bigger in absolute value. And that means that the terms themselves are not approaching zero. So 
If this L comes out greater than 1, the terms with absolute value signs around them are not approaching 0. But that means the terms without the absolute value signs around them are not approaching 0. And that means by the term test for divergence that the series diverges. So it's the term test here. The fact that L is greater than 1 tells us that the terms are not approaching 0 um, that tells us that this diverges. I'm just trying to emphasize the fact we are not concluding divergence here from the fact that putting absolute value signs around the BKs gives us a divergent series. And once again, if L equals 1, the test fails. The series could converge or diverge. Um, so this is a bad case for the test. It doesn't tell you anything. Okay, so that's the ratio test. You ought to be able to figure out what the root test says with absolute value signs in it. <laughs> Replace the word ratio with root. And you replace this by the kth root, now the absolute value of b sub k. So, and you have the same type of conclusion, just like we did when we did the, the root test for non-negative series. Um, using the ratio test with absolute value signs around it is no harder than using the, the ratio test for non-negative series. Um, it just means you get to ignore a lot of minus signs. So, as usual, as was true with non-negative series, it's the ratio test that gets used the most in examples, not the the root test. Um, so suppose we um, take a look at minus the sum is k goes from 0 to infinity of minus 2 to the k over k factorial. Oh my god, does this converge or diverge? Well it's not it's not non-negative because this minus 2 to the k, the sign's going to be positive, then negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So um, you have to you know, worry about the fact that this is non-negative. But the, as far as the ratio test goes, you don't have to worry much. If you look at the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth plus first term um, over the kth term. So we take minus 2 to the k plus 1 ah. with absolute value signs around everything. Uh, oh, you replace the k's with the quantity k plus 1. Get this down here, you replace, or you just have the kth term. You invert and multiply, and the effect of the absolute value signs is just to wipe out these minus signs. So, I'm going to drop the absolute value signs, but wipe out the minus signs. And what you get is k factorial over k plus 1 factorial. And times, uh, I'm wiping out the minus signs, uh, 2 to the k plus 1 divided by 2 to the k. As you should remember, or be able to calculate quickly, this is 1 over k plus 1. And this is 2. As k goes to infinity, this is 0. 0 is less than 1. So this converges. And it doesn't just converge. It converges absolutely. You're not going to be able to conclude conditional convergence from the ratio test. It either tells you the series diverges or that it converges absolutely. It can never tell you that something converges conditionally. To know that something converges conditionally, you have to know two things. You have to know the series converges, so you have to prove that somehow. But you have to know that it, the series with absolute value signs around the term diverges. So conditional convergence is typically harder to prove. You have to prove two things. Um, OK, so there is the question of. <laughs> How can you ever tell that something converges conditionally? Um, you know, we have the, the ratio and the root test to show that things converge absolutely. In fact, 
we, after we put absolute value signs around the terms, we could use any of our, or any of our tests for non-negative series. Right? I mean, if we put absolute values around the terms, and like we did with, when we had 1 over k squared, and I negated the terms with the 1 over a prime number squared, we could convert, uh, conclude that that converges absolutely because once we put in absolute value signs, it was a p-series. We can use any of our tests for non-negative series um, to try to prove absolute convergence, but what do we have that allows us to conclude conditional convergence? Basically, we have one big test for that. It's called the alternating series test. So this applies to alternating series, series in which the terms go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, or minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Um, um, what you could say is that uh, the fancy way of saying that is a, a series um, a series of terms so don't explicitly put in the pluses or minus, a series is alternating. Now, really, what you want is that the terms go positive, negative, positive, negative, or possibly zero is alternating. If either, all right, this is the fancy way of saying it, if either AK equals minus 1 to the K times the absolute value of AK, for all k greater than or equal to m, or a k equals minus 1 to the k minus 1 times the absolute value of a k for all k greater than or equal to m. Don't let this bother you. All this means is we made it, we took the positive part and then inserted this alternating plus or minus sign. Plus this is just a fancy way of saying it either, the terms either go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, or they could do minus, plus. These are the alternating series. Um, and we have a test, a general test for, for showing that alternating series converge. So the alternating series test is a theorem, and the theorem says, the theorem, this is really the alternating series test, suppose Is, has the following properties. So one, the series is alternating. That's why it's called the alternating series test. Two, the absolute values of the terms decrease. Two, so the absolute value of the next term is less than or equal to the absolute value of the term before it for all k greater than or equal to m. And three, the limit that a k is approach zero. The limit is k approaches infinity if a k is zero. This is equivalent to saying the limit of the absolute values. This is equivalent to right, that some numbers approach zero if and only if their absolute values approach zero. So it's equivalent to this. 
All right, suppose those three, three things are true, then the series converges. So then sum as k goes from m to infinity of a k converges. This does not say that the series converges conditionally. It just says it converges. To know that it converges conditionally, you would still need to know that when you put absolute value signs around the AKs, you get something divergent. Right? To prove conditional convergence, you have to prove convergence of the series and divergence when you put absolute value signs around the terms of the series. So this is the alternating series test. There's actually a in additional part to this, which is if, so assume all these conditions are true so that this infinite sum exists. If you let Sn equal the nth partial sum and just for notation, let S infinity be the sum of the series. Then what you can show in the midst of this proof is that, yeah, you'd like to know something about the infinite sum. I mean, ideally, <laughs> we talk about whether series converge or, or diverge. When they converge, Ideally, we would be able to say what they converge to, or at least have some bounds on what they converge to. You know, maybe we don't know what it converges to, but it's between 2.5 and 2.6. That would be nice. And we can get bounds on the infinite. Oh, look, I didn't write anything. Um, we can get bounds on the infinite sum here in terms of the partial sums. It's you write the absolute value of the difference between the infinite sum and the nth partial sum. Um, so how well does this nth partial sum approximate the whole infinite sum? And the answer is, this is less than or equal to the absolute value of the next term that's not in this partial sum, which would be a sub n plus 1. So that you get some bound. In fact, if you write this, you could write this, this absolute value means that minus it means the absolute value signs here mean that S infinity minus Sn is trapped between the absolute value of An plus 1 and negative the absolute value of An plus 1. Um, right, it, right, if we had an, like an epsilon here, it, saying that the absolute value of this is less it's less than or equal to epsilon means that that thing is between plus or minus epsilon. So doing that, adding S in both places, or at all three places, it means that we get these bounds on S infinity. You can go out as far as you want in the partial sums, and then add and subtract the absolute value of the next term, and S infinity is somewhere in there. So it's nice to have some bounds that you could compute if you felt like it. Um, so, what are examples of, the, of using the alternating series test? Well, it would tell us that the harmonic series converges. Of course, we already knew that, so let's just do a, let's do a slightly different example. So, consider sum as k goes from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the k minus 1 of 1 over the square root of k. All right. What does this series look like? It goes 1 minus 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1 over the square root of 3 minus 1 over the square root of 4 plus 1 square root, and so on. The series alternates. The terms are going plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. The series alternates. Um, the terms are decreasing in absolute value. So you just ignore the minus signs. Yes, the terms, which is plus signs, are decreasing in absolute value. 
And yeah, the terms approach zero as k goes to infinity. So the alternating series test, by the alternating series test, the series converges. Now, this doesn't tell us that the series converges conditionally, or it certainly doesn't tell us it converges absolutely, but it doesn't tell us the series converges conditionally. To know that, it's true, but to know that, we have to look at the series with absolute value signs around the terms. We have to go, what does this series do? Oh, well, that is a p-series. Once we put in the absolute value signs, the effect of putting in the absolute value signs is just to wipe out the minus 1 to the k minus 1. We get 1 over the square root of k, which I'll write as 1 over k to the 1 half. This is a p series. p is a half. And a half is less than or equal to 1. So by the p series test, this diverges. So what we've just shown is that, yeah, this series converges by the alternating series test, but when you throw in the absolute value signs, you get a divergent series. That means this converges conditionally. This converges conditionally. It converges, but when you put in absolute value signs, it diverges. And really, pretty much, the only way, the only good test we have for con that will let you conclude conditional convergence is the alternating series test, because you need to know the series diverges when you put in absolute value signs, so that none of our tests for, for convergence from our sectional non-negative series can help you at that point. Um, uh, but after you know it diverges with absolute value signs in it, you still need to prove that it converges. You know, the, uh, the ratio test and the root test, you know, if, you, if you get that it diverges from one of those, then, then the, when you put in absolute value signs, then it tells you the series diverges. But none of our tests from the previous section can help us decide, can help us tell if something converges conditionally, if that's what it does. Um, let me look at another example where we get absolute convergence just to, just to emphasize the point that the alternating series test can tell you a series converges even when the series converges, absolutely. That's not a problem. And this bound, this bound on the terms also applies even if the series converges, absolutely. So as another example, let's just take the sum is k goes from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the k minus 1 times 1 over k cubed. All right. Well, if you put absolute value signs around the terms, you get the p series, where p is 3. p 3 is greater than 1. So this series converges absolutely. Well, that's fine. But it also converges by the alternating series test. Why? I won't, I won't even write it. It certainly alternates because of this minus 1 to the k minus 1. It's alternating. When you take the absolute values of the terms, um, as k gets bigger, the terms definitely get smaller. So the terms are decreasing in absolute value. And as k goes to infinity, certainly the terms approach 0. So this converges. Yes, it converges absolutely. It also converges by the alternating series test. And because it converges by the alternating series test, we can do this, this estimate that suppose you want to estimate, all right, what is can you tell me what this series adds up to? Well, no. <laughs> no. But I can tell you that if you approximate it by the fourth partial sum, so go up here to, to 4, the, the absolute value of that difference is less than or equal to the absolute value of the next term that's not our partial sum. That would be where k is 5, so less than or equal to 1 over 5 cubed. So if you really wanted to estimate this infinite sum, you calculate this fourth partial sum, 
So that's just you know, four terms that you have to add up. And then you say, yeah, then this sum is trapped between that plus 1 over 5 cubed and this minus 1 over 5 cubed. So you get some bounds on the infinite, on the sum of the series. All right, there's, um, there's one last, so this is basically all that's in the section. I do want to do one more example, and it is something we really couldn't do in before now. I want to apply this to finding the interval of convergence of a power series. So let me modify greatly this. So let's take, we haven't looked at power series in a while. And in a sense, and, and I've said before that in a sense, all these, these theorems on sequences and series that we've been looking at in the last few sections are kind of the technical details of stuff we used um, or could have used when we looked at power series. We actually only used the ratio test for power series, but that was because we decided we wouldn't care about exactly finding the interval of convergence. We wouldn't worry about what happens at the endpoints of the interval. We would just worry about finding the radius of convergence and worry about the endpoints now when we have more tests at our disposal. So here's a power series. Um, it has, it, this one is centered at three, and it has a radius of convergence, and the radius of convergence tells you almost exactly where this converges. It will tell you everything except what happens at the endpoints of the interval of convergence, and now we're able to deal with those also. So let's, let's do this example, just so you can see what this has to do with power series. So uh, I want to take this and find the interval, not just the radius of convergence. Find the interval of convergence. Well, um, uh, we first have to do the ratio test to find the radius of convergence so that we know, you know what, where the endpoints are and those will be the last things we check. So first, find the radius of convergence. And for that, use the ratio test, as we did in that section. Find the radius of convergence. So you take the limit as k goes to infinity of the absolute value of the k plus first term. We're going to put in absolute values. It's going to wipe out all the minus ones to the all the minus one to the powers. So I'm just going to not write those in the first place. I want this, the k plus first term, x minus 3 to the k plus 1 over the square root of k plus 1 divided by x minus 3 to the k over the square root of k. This is, if you invert, multiply, this is the limit as k goes to infinity of, you get the square root of k over the square root of k plus 1 times the absolute value of x minus 3. This limit is 1. I'll leave that as an exercise. This limit is 1. And so you get 1 times the absolute value of x minus 3. So you get the absolute value of x minus 3. So the series converges when the absolute value of x, so we're doing the ratio test. The ratio test says you calculate this limit and the, your series converges if this is less than 1 and diverges if this is greater than 1. Well, that means the radius of convergence is 1. Right? So the radius of convergence, r here, is 1. Um, and so what, what does it mean the interval of convergence is? It's centered at 3 but you could go up by one unit to four and down by one unit to two. So your interval of convergence, except 
for knowing what it does at the endpoint is between 2 and 4, because we need for this absolute value to be less than 1, or less than or equal to 1, but we don't know what happens when it equals 1. All right, so this we could do before. That's not the real point of what I'm discussing now. Then there's analyze what happens at the endpoints, 2 and 4. If we want the entire interval of convergence to know exactly where the series converges and where it diverges, we have to analyze what happens at the endpoints. So that, oh, by the way, I should have said this. Not only, and I, I said this, I said this in the, in the section on convergence of series, but then we didn't really know what converging absolutely, well, we did know what converging absolutely meant, but we hadn't talked about it much. Um, it's not just that the series converges between 2 and 4, it converges absolutely, which is important. It means you know, it's like a real sum of things. Rearranging doesn't affect what's going on. Um, the second thing you need to do is check the, see what happens at the endpoints. At the endpoints. We need to know whether the series converges at the endpoints of the interval of convergence, diverges, and um, if it converges, we, we're interested in whether it converges absolutely or conditionally. I mean, we'd really like to know about convergence versus divergence, but if it converges, it would be nice to know whether it converges absolutely or conditionally. See what happens at the endpoint of the interval of convergence. So you just plug those into the series and look and use your tests. So there are two endpoints. So one of them is you plug in x equals 2. That was one of the endpoints. And you'll also plug in x equals 4, the other endpoint. And you look at the series that you get. So when we plug in x equals 2, we get minus 1 to the k minus 1. And up here, let me, I'll write it as x minus 3 again for a minute, for a second, but I'll change it. So here's our series. But now we're interested in what happens when we actually put in x equals 2. So you put in this 2 here. Well, this is minus 1. And this is minus 1 to the k. So you get another minus 1 to the k. Well, you can multiply those and add the exponents. You will, if you add the exponents, you get minus 1 to the 2k minus 1. So you get minus 1 to the 2k minus 1. And you might think, oh my god, yeah, what, what, what good does that do me? Well, that's an odd number. My, no matter what k is, 2k minus 1 is odd. Minus 1 to an odd power is minus 1. This series just becomes minus 1. over the square root of k, or what's the same thing, we know from property, general properties of series that you can pull out constant multiples. This is this, and this series converges if and only if this series converges, you know, with the, or if and only if that series converges, and if they both converge, you can move the minus sign out. But, but we know that diverges. This is a p-series. This is a p-series with p equals a half. And a half is less than or equal to 1. This diverges, so this, this thing with the minus sign where you've negated every term, this diverges. Um, it's negative a P series. It's, <laughs> let me say, it's the negation. where p is a half, which is less than or equal to 1. All right, so 2 is not in the interval of convergence. The series diverges at 2. What happens at 4? If you put in, so once again, our series was minus 1 to the k minus 1, where x minus 3 to the k divided by the square root of k. Oh, 
Now what happens when you put in x equals 4? Well, then this is just 1, and 1 to the k is 1. So what you end up with is the sum as k goes from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the k minus 1 times 1 over the square root of k. Oh, but we already looked at this. This is an alternating series. Yes, this would, if you put in absolute value signs, you get a divergent series, because you get a p series where p is a half, just like we did a second ago. So if you put in absolute value signs, this diverges, but it converges by the alternating series test. It alternates because of this minus 1 to the k minus 1 times something positive. It alternates. The terms are decreasing in absolute value, and the terms approach 0. This converges conditionally. So that what's, we've now answered a question that we couldn't answer earlier in our, when we first looked at power series. The entire interval of convergence, it does not include 2 does include 4. The interval of convergence of this series is, if you want to write it like this, it converges when x is 4, it diverges when x is 2, and you can say more. It, it converges absolutely between 2 and 4, if you're strictly between, but right at 4, it converges conditionally. All right, that is all that I want to say about series. There are a lot of proofs involved in this. Um, uh, a lot of them are fairly intuitive. Um, you could, we could have talked about them, but the tests themselves are already kind of technical. People find them difficult to remember and difficult to apply. Um, you can certainly read the proofs in the book. Um, so that's, uh, that's the end of the book.